In memoriam of Dr. Rosalind Terborg Penn of the Association of Black Women Historians, I'm beginning a series celebrating and telling little uh, little pieces, little gems of uh, of information, and telling little stories about black women that none of us um, likely, none of you likely knew um so and this is also in memoriam of like all the women who find themselves violated physically sexually or otherwise the black women who find themselves violated um at the hands of pretty much everybody um because it is a an idea uh, that everybody can do what they want to a black woman and there will be no consequences because at present there have been none. So clearly y'all got us fucked up. So I'm just gonna start recording um, different pieces about different wonderful black women and then next month, I'll go back to talking about white people. I'll go back to finishing the series on white trash. I'll finish that during Black History Month. So to start with, we're gonna start with Sojourner Truth. Um, so one of the things that irritates me as a historian is that people talk about Sojourner Truth and when they reference like when they paraphrase or when they directly quote her, they leave out the context. You know, something that I, I bring up a lot in my videos is context because it's fucking relevant. So um, they leave out the fact that the reason that she spoke the way that she did is not because she was a former slave or because she didn't know English. It's because English was not her first language. Her first language was Dutch. And so when she would pronounce words a certain kind of way, it's because... Um, is it wasn't because she was ill informed or uneducated. Um, you know, they say that she couldn't read or write, but I'm still looking into whether that is a fact because, um, not even her for her famous, um, address that she gave in Akron, Ohio to, you know, some pre feminist feminist, uh, league. Like, even that, the recounts of what she said in that, um, in that speech is, is inaccurate because it's reworded as though she is, is, is in broken English, but she did not give it in, in broken English. She gave it in near perfect English because she was well informed, well, and well educated. Um, like she did know how to read and she did know how to write because she was a Bible thumper. In order to be a Bible thumper, you got to know how to read. You got to know how to read that shit. Um, but anyway, so, um, her, her master was, I think his last name was Dumont, like somebody Dumont. And he was a shithead. And so she ran away from the, um, like, like most of them. She, um, she ran off and she got in touch with some people who helped her out, some abolitionists. And then New York passed the anti-slavery laws. Um, and while she, and while she was, you know, away, like, um, kind of in hiding from him and also, you know, just going out and sharing, you know, God's word and talking about, you know, um, liberty for, for women and drawing a parallel between the, the issues that black people face and the issues that women face. She found out that her son had been sold to a slave owner at like a couple years after the anti-slave laws were passed. Her her previous um, slave 
uh, her previous owner did that. And so she sued him and won. And that was, historically, that was the first time that a black woman sued a white man in that sort of ascent, in, in that setting, and, and won the shit. And so she won her, her son back. And then she went around and she started, you know, talking about what it was like to be a slave and things of that nature because she did have 13 children who, and I don't know if all of them were sold from her, um, from, you know, the same plantation as her, but a lot of them were, at least seven of them were. And so she went around talking about things like that and she started speaking of for prostitutes actually because um, she had a heart for them and she understood their point of view and tried to get other people to understand her their point of view as well. You know, her understanding the selling yourself, you know, even though in her instance, it wasn't by choice. And so she would speak up for like prostitutes and things like that. And then um, there was an instance where, and, and these videos is not to like try and cover everything because that's not what I'm doing. I'm just pointing out different things about these people, these women that makes them remarkable. So, so Journal Truth was like six feet, six foot, and she had a deep voice. And by the time she was free and she was going around talking to people, she was, um, she was older. So she, you know, her looks were hard. And so, like, she was tall, and, like, white men would be like, oh, that's a dude. And, um, and because she, like, she had, like, a strong stare. Like, she wasn't timid. And, you know, she, she would eyeball him. And they didn't like that, so they were like, oh, that's a man. And so she was like, they were like, one time she was out, you know, spreading her words and things like that and they were like oh we'll prove it and so she showed him her titties and she was like yeah you know I've nursed a lot of white kids you know even when I, w I couldn't nurse my own like I used to nurse a lot of white kids and she was like you know did y'all want to suck my my breasts too okay <laughs> She was like, did you want to suck them too? And then they they, they got quiet after that. Um, so then we have, okay, we have Josephine Baker. Josephine Baker, you know, she's a dancer, comedian, uh, you know, theater. She was into theater. She was a performer. But what a lot of people don't know is that um, um, during her lifetime, she witnessed three different wars. One of them was World War II and... Um, initially she had came out in support of Mussolini, like before he aligned himself with Hitler and, uh, Churchill. And so she had, you know, she supported his ideas about going into, about going into Ethiopia. And I'm still looking into why she supported him, like what it was about his rhetoric that she supported, um... But then she she wound up changing, but a lot of people didn't know that she wound up re withdrawing her support from him because he started like taking these, he started mirroring Hitler and he would go and invade like Spain and Greece. And um, of course, once he joined forces with them, you know, she, she disaligned herself from them, but they didn't know that. So, you know, being that she spent majority of her time in France. Um, she, she linked up with the French allies and so she started being a spy for them. And because Mussolini's men like didn't know that she wasn't rocking with them, she was able to get away with things. So she was like, um, she was able to take pictures sometimes and, um, she would like sneak the pictures in her underwear and, um, she would take like notes and, you know, because she was a musician as well, she had a lot of sheet music. And so she would like take notes and she would write them in invisible ink on her sheet notes. And, um, she was a fucking, she was a spy. And so she, you know, being that the French were allies with us, with the United States, 
a lot of um a lot of the information that she came back with wound up being beneficial in helping to win World War II. Okay. But she would she would she would sneak things in and she would like play on her feminine wiles and things like that and it worked. And so then we have Lorraine Hansberry. She was the first black female author to have a play on Broadway. And her father is one of the first people to win a Supreme Court case um, uh, essentially against redlining, which is, you know, it's like banks and um, real estate um, owners like refusing to... Um, provide black people like allow oppor black people the same opportunity to live in um in good neighborhoods hold on what oh blood oh my gosh okay well don't touch it okay I have to take her to the vet. Put her down, honey, and go wash your yeah, hands. The vet that are that are for cats. Mm hmm And pick the door that have a cat on it, and you will pick the right vet that is for cats. Yep, yeah, yeah, baby. We already have a vet, so we'll take her to the same vet we take Rock him to. Okay. Go wash your hands, please. Yes. I just, I just, uh, okay, baby. Okay, that sounds like a great idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I want you to go potty while you're in there, too, please. So, um, then we have Lorraine Hansberry, who, um, <clears throat> she was fiery. Um, she was spicy. And so, um, there was a, <clears throat> there was a, a time when her and, uh, a bunch of other people were invited to go and talk to, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, Robert, well, I don't think it's Robert F. Kennedy. I think I mixed his name with his brothers. Robert Kennedy. Um, so, like, there was other people there, you know, James Baldwin, Lena Horne, Kenneth Clark, who was, like, a well-known psychologist. Uh, I think Harry Belafonte was there. Um... It was a lot of people there. You know, it was the people that were the face of the civil rights movement. You know, the activists who were hands-on, who were very, um, who weren't very, um, appeasing towards, uh, white people. And then there was a freedom writer, writer named Jerome Smith who was there, who had been assaulted and beaten and had, had a number of different experiences, um, in the South that, um, and who was like essentially like the face of the movement. You know, a lot of times, she's singing, um, He was the face of the movement, though. They would have, like, different figures who were, like, the leaders, supposed leaders of these different organizations, like the SN Southern, the SNC, SN. I don't know, those different organizations that have acronyms, like the Southern Christian Leaders, whatever, NAACP, um, 
Which, you know, they would have, like, a black person who was, like, the spokesman, but it was always ran by Jewish people who paid those spokesmen to keep us docile and keep us from cracking these cracking people's heads, right? But Jerome Smith was one of the faces of the movement, you know, because he actually had real-life experiences of what it was like having to exist around, you know, like, really fucking violent white people. And so they had to sit down and, um, you know, Bobby uh, Kennedy and, like, the Justice Department, they start, like, you know, patting themselves on the black back for the little bit of, you know, efforts that they made that really didn't have, um, it didn't really do much. And it certainly wasn't, like, addressing the fact that um, black people were being attacked in every way they could and for trying to have rights and then they were being attacked for defending themselves and so it was like one of those situations where black people were being made to feel like they just were not allowed to defend themselves because that you know that's like part of the foundation of this country and so they start stroking themselves in the meeting and Jerome broke down and I think he started crying. I'm, I, yeah, he did. He broke down crying because he was just like, you know, just, I can't say, I think he's still living. I would love to interview him. But I can't say, but I think that it was from, not only from the trauma, do not eat that. Baby, it is too early. I have some blackberries and some blueberries soaking in there. Okay, that you can you can have with your oatmeal, but under no circumstances are you eating those sweets. Okay, don't be upset, honey. You can have some later. Oh, okay. Gonna you gonna close the door behind you? So, um, okay, so I'm sure it was like the trauma of having been through that, of, of the things that he had faced, you know, the, the, the constant attacks, you know, the like physical attacks, the verbal attacks, seeing other people being attacked, you know, it's very traumatizing to have somebody put their fucking hands on you. And it's very traumatizing to has to sit up and scream. And that's one of the things that makes that video of Shakisha Clemens, of the young lady in the beauty supply store here in Charlotte, which somehow is still getting business. I went and got my hair braided. Braided. Um, she did a horrible job. I went and got my hair braided like maybe a year ago, like very, like right around the time that that they, um, those people in that beauty supply store attacked that woman. And I went, like, the young lady tried to send me to that beauty supply store, and she, she didn't ask me, but she assumed that I, um, that when I went to get some more hair, that I had gotten lost. And it was like, nah, I'm not going to that beauty supply store ever again. But when I go, um, in that direction, and I see that the beauty, that the store is still standing. It just is so infuriating. And so then you have like the young lady at the McDonald's where it's like, I, um, I have a, a mixture of like anger and deep deep compassion for people who find themselves in a position where not only is someone physically attacking them but nobody defends them and they have to defend their right to defend themselves how fucking traumatizing how incredibly traumatizing so 
Going back to Jerome, so he's like, he breaks down and he's crying because he's like, you know, you guys have the audacity to applaud yourselves because in comparison to Eisenhower, who had been the president before um, Kennedy took over, and I don't remember if this meeting was, um, was before or after he got killed. It's not relevant, but, um... It's like, you know, you guys are applauding yourselves for the little bit of things that you're doing, essentially, to be in, like, collusion with the with the time right now. It's like, and to get the black vote. But you're not actually doing anything, doing anything on a state level. You, there are no consequences for these people that are doing the things that they are. And, like, what you're doing is not enough. And so he was like, you know, <sighs> listening to you applaud yourselves makes me want to puke. And so after that, like, the whole vibes shifted and, like, Bobby had already dismissed him, like, as soon as he came in anyway. Because, again, there was, like, Lena Horne and James Baldwin, Lorraine Hansberry, like, all these accomplished black figures. And then him. And Bobby didn't know who he was. Even though, as Lorraine said, you know, this is the person in the room that you should be paying attention to. That's what she said. Like, she, she had at him. And she was like, you know, out of all of us, like, we're just here in support. But this person that you dismissed from the second he came in, and then after he said, you know, I don't know why you guys are patting yourself on the back. You make me, you make me sick. Like, Bobby, like, shifted in his chair. Like, he turned his body language away from him. Like, he turned his body away from him. Like, probably crossed his head, probably did this number, you know. And, you know, he probably did one of them. And, like, he shifted his body away from him and was just, like, which is a, a, a sign of being of dismissal and disrespect. And so Lorraine was like, you know, you need to turn yourself back around because this is the person who, you know, supposedly if your intention is to change the trajectory of people in this country, this is the person who... Is front row. This is the person who you should be listening to. This is the only person in this room who you should be listening to. And so it was like a really tense meeting because he kept trying to applaud himself for doing nothing. And then he did that thing that so many white people do that have the audacity to do. And that is to try and draw a comparative between the fact that his family came here as immigrants. And um, had to work their way up with the help of the mob. He didn't say that part, though. But they have mob ties. And so he tried to draw that comparative, like, oh, well, I understand. And they're just like, that's infuriating to have someone try and, like, draw a comparative between what black people faced and faced. And draw a comparison between their own struggles when their skin is white and they are male. Because there is no comparison. Now, granted, there are some similarities, especially with, you know... It's not like I don't understand his point of view because his ancestors came up during a time where the word white didn't exist yet. And so, I'm sure they did face a lot of shit because different... Groups of Europeans had different, like, they didn't have rights. They didn't have a lot of rights. They didn't have a lot of the same rights. They didn't have the money. Like, they definitely fell victim to being um, the wrong kind of European, you know, not being British, a British descent, not having a lot of money and things of that nature. So, you know, a lot of them were indentured slaves. A lot of them did, like fall victim to these systems that, you know, to overtaxation and things like that, and fell victim to these systems that kept them in predominantly black neighborhoods or predominantly poor neighborhoods that are considered predominantly black because the people that lived there were usually black, right? So it's automatically, you know, these poor neighborhoods were considered to be black when in actuality it's the economic thing, right? So it's not like his point... His point was just, it was fucking inappropriate. And again, there is no comparison. There is no comparison. There are similarities, but no comparison. Okay? Soak that in. Right? 
And so, like, they just had at him, and he was pissed off by the time the meeting ended because Lorraine, like, she stood up and she chewed into him, and she was like, look, either you guys are going to physically defend us, which they would not do, and you were going to call troops to physically defend us on a state level and call the National Guard to defend us on a state level, or we're going to have to defend ourselves. But they took that to mean, like, oh, well, she's talking crazy, and... You know, she's talking about having guns in the streets and putting guns in the hands of random people. And it's like, and that's a way of trivializing her entire point because her point was that people needed to be physically defended. And if the people who were put in place so-called to defend all people would not exercise that on the behalf of black people, but would exercise it against black people, but not on their behalf, then people had no choice, you know, rationally, of course, but to arm themselves, which is the same thing that the Black Panthers were saying and the same thing. And, you know, their point of view was twisted around and turned around as well because their entire point was stop putting us in a position where we have to physically defend ourselves and then turning around. And when we physically defend ourselves with our hands or with weaponry, you turn around and villainize us like we're crazy, like we're sitting up here and just carrying guns for the sake of it. But we wouldn't have these guns if you guys didn't use guns against us. And so part of Lorraine's also points were, you know, you have these police officers who keep coming and just killing people and then they hide behind the fact that, okay, well, it's a police officer as if somehow a black person should be honored to be murdered by them. Or as if somehow it's like, oh, okay, well, your job protects you from the fact that you are still a white man trying to murder me for no reason than because of your issues with race and the fact that you're power hungry and you feel entitled to do so. And so it's like, regardless... It's like, you're not entitled to kill us, whether it's because of your profession, because of your race, because of your gender, or the combination of all three. And which usually it was the case of all three, a white male police officer, right? And so she's just like, look, you haven't done anything and you don't deserve to be sitting up here um, dismissing our point of view you don't deserve to be patting yourself on the back and so forth and so on and she just really chewed into him and he was really you know a lot of them did and he was really mad about that and she just got up and left Lorraine like had at him and then she was just like okay uh attorney general and she gave him like you know this look and she left I think she might have had shades on she left um and then, you know, after that, Bobby called J. Edgar Hoover and had a bunch of their phones tapped. She had, um, you know, and knowing at that time what J. Edgar Hoover was, um, was like and was capable of, you know, he was a, like, I think he was the director of the FBI at that time. And so he was like, you know, follow... Mal uh, not Malcolm X, Martin Luther King's lawyer was there. And he was like, bug him, follow him. Bug James Baldwin, follow him, because Baldwin got at him as well. Um, I don't think he had Lorraine Hansberry follow. I think Jerome Smith, she had, she, he had him followed and had him surveillance as well. And so, and then they... Then they did that thing where they create an FBI record to make it seem like, you know, having a differing point of view and defending yourself. And it shows the true intentions of Bobby Kennedy of wanting to defend yourself against, you know, people who feel entitled to murder you now makes you suspicious. Not the act of your rights and your life, you know, being compromised. That part didn't place any of the people who, you know, who hunted black people, it didn't make them a target for the FBI and that they should be surveilled. Just the people who were trying to exercise their right to defend themselves, which is like a human right. And so, you know, they had these FBI files created about them and Bobby was like, you know, wanting to see like what they had to say. And even then, like... When he started working on his uh, 
bibliography, actually at the time he was already working on it because the author of his bibliography was in the meeting too. <clears throat> and he just kept making it seem like, you know, <clears throat> like Lorraine Hansberry and James Baldwin and all of them, like they were just like possessed. I believe he used the word possessed. Like he villainized them for not being, not appeasing him and for standing their ground and for um, being hell bent on a specific outcome and that outcome being um, black liberation and justice and the protection for black people and not putting the power and the um, realization of those things solely in the hands of the Attorney General uh, Kennedy and the Justice Department, but saying that, you know, either you're going to get with it or you're going to get rolled over, right? Um, love calls. I have to go. Uh, Feel free to make this go viral and share it and subscribe and leave feedback. Wait, what do they say? Like, comment, subscribe. Yeah, that. <laughs>